The Hollywood size ego within a 12 year old character level. As long as I was performing on the baseball field, bringing home good grades, there was really no issue to be raised. Nobody really knew that on the back end, this star baseball player, this college student was uh, deteriorating. I had friends around me, um, homeboys, I guess you could say, that sold cocaine and so kind of pushed me over the edge of becoming a heavy cocaine user. I was in my dorm room and we had a team meeting and it had been kind of noted by the, by the coach that I was selling marijuana to the rest of the team. And he called me into his office. It was Monday morning. He said, uh, you know, you're, we're releasing you from the team and we're actually uh, releasing you from the school. I came home for a few days, got in touch with a, a coach that recruited me out of high school. So I got kicked out of one college on a Tuesday and signed another scholarship two days later. That fall, everything was going good until around September. And, and I got arrested for the first time. For possession of marijuana with the intent to distribute, I was on probation for three years and I never, I never reported because I could never pass a drug urinalysis test that they require you to take every month. The first time that I violated probation, they, they gave me a month in the county jail. And so I get out and they reinstate my probation and I violate again. I don't report, they come get me again. I do two months this time. And every time I would come out of county jail, or every, every event that would take place, I would get harder and harder in my heart and in my mind state. And I get out after doing two months and don't report again. The judge took the three years probation that he put me on and he revoked every bit of it. And he sent me to the Department of Corrections for the state of Alabama for the remainder of my probation, which was 15 months. I would say that prison, enhanced what I already was as a drug user, someone who sold drugs. For me, prison was a breeding ground, so to speak. Got out in June of 2006. I remember struggling and, and battling this mindset of, if I go back to the street, if I go back to selling drugs and doing drugs, the worst thing that they can do to me is send me back to prison. And it was, it was nothing, it, it was not even a second thought. I'm in the club one night and, and me and my buddy walk, both walk outside to his Cadillac and I did the line of ice with him. I became someone who, who immersed himself in the crystal meth lifestyle. So not just was I selling ice, but we were also manufacturing our own. Early September of, of 2008, I went to jail for trafficking methamphetamines and manufacturing methamphetamines. I went in front of the judge and um, he sentenced me to 15 years for the trafficking and 15 years for the manufacturing, but he ran them concurrent where there would be one 15 year sentence. But I became a gang member, an intravenous drug user, all within the first you know, two or three years of, of that prison bid. And everything changed. I, I fought the guards. I would fight rival gang members. Yeah, my mindset was I had been dealt this life. Let's just, let's just get it, let's just go. I could care less how I treated you. I could care less how I treated anything that you cared about. All I cared about was my brothers that I, that I banged with or my homeboys that I scored dope with. But the one thing though that affected me was, um, was, you know, knowing that I didn't, my family was just, um, I didn't have any relationship with my father at the time. And, and I had really put my mother through hell. I was this, this professional baseball talent athlete that had professional, um, capabilities and here I am, a gang member, a, a drug addict, a drug user, someone who has no value on life. I couldn't think like that because it was, it was not reality for me anymore that I thought. That life, the life that I had been handed to me, baseball, a uh, family, I destroyed it. I had burned every bridge imaginable. And so I would just put a needle in my arm and get high again and it would go away. Late October, mid to late October, I got invited by one of the guys that I'd met on the prison yard playing basketball with. He, he invited me to a, a, a chapel service. And I, I go in there and I, I hear the message and, and it wasn't one particular thing about the message that made me want to get saved. But I, I did go back to my dorm and I, I told the guy, hey man, thanks for inviting me, I enjoyed it. And he was really zealous, you know, he was saved and he was really about the Lord. And, Hey man, you'll come tomorrow. And I was like, yeah, man, I'll come back tomorrow. But the one thing that I did do that, that night when I was on my rack was I picked up the Bible. So for two weeks, 
um, I just read the Bible and I went to the chapel. The Holy Spirit was, was beginning to, to minister to, to me and, and soften my heart through the Word of God. At Easterling, they show movies Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. You can go into the chapel service and watch a movie. And I walk in and, they're, and on the screen, they're playing uh, The Passion of Christ. I remember right then in that moment watching Jesus, uh, you know, <laughs> say things like, um, you know, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do. And I remember thinking, he's, he's, he was talking about me. You know, I remember him standing there and uh, they want to give over, it's either him or, or Barabbas, you know, and I remember watching this movie and thinking, dude, the whole my life, you know what I'm saying, you did that. All my life, you did that for me and I had, I had no knowledge of it. You know, I didn't know that. Here I am, a, I, don't, I don't care about life. And, and I remember making the decision right there, like, I don't even know what's happening. I was crying like I am now, but it was really more intense. And I remember asking Jesus, like, if you, uh, if this is you that's doing this, you know, and, and you have me crying, I hadn't cried in years. I hadn't cried in years. And I remember thinking, if this is you, then please don't stop. You know, because I don't have the power to, I don't even know if you're real. But I, I, I want to give my life to you, and if, if that's even how you do it, you know? I don't know the protocol of a salvation prayer. I have never heard a salvation prayer. I didn't know the Romans road. I didn't know none of that. It was me and Jesus and me and the Holy Spirit right there. And, and I remember saying, I give my life to you. And, and from that day forward, that was, that was late October, early November of 2012. And I remember I just, I fully submitted my life in that moment on that chapel church pew in that, in that level four prison institution. I submitted my life to Jesus and, and I made a deal with him. You know, I'll serve you. You know, if you'll change, if, you, if you'll help change my life. Last month was my five year of being out of prison. It's my sixth year of being saved. I got married, like I said, to my high school sweetheart. We have a ministry house in Columbus, um, and we minister to the homeless, we minister to prostitutes, we minister to drug addicts and gang members, and it's just what we do. Whether you're without hope, whether you're a drug addict, whether you're a gang member, whether you're somebody that life has, has totally just beat up, the gospel really is simple. Everything in our life is wrapped up in the gospel, and, and you don't have to be somebody who, who has it all figured out. You know, I, I met the Lord sitting on a, a prison chapel pew by myself. You know, the, the Lord Jesus is, is the restorer of all things that you lost in your life or all things that, that, that you've freely given away or, or He's the restorer of hope. He's the restorer of dreams. But I was a drug addict. I was a gang member. I was the most hardened criminal there was. And, uh, and Jesus has the power to, to change my whole life.